We have one last topic to talk about before we are done with cells, and that is to look at the way that cells go about reproducing and the activities of what are referred to as the cell cycle, the life cycle of an individual cell. So we'll just hop right in. So when we think about body cells, and that's what I mean when I say somatic cells, these are the body cells as opposed to the reproductive cells. So eggs and sperm follow a different pathway in their cell cycle. But um, the rest of the body cells undergo this type of a life cycle. So just after they have finished dividing, so we're starting right here at this point, we have two new cells from one cell. And the first phase that the cells enter is called the G1 phase. G1 stands for growth or gap one, um, depending on who you talk to and how they learned it and how they think of these phases of the, of the cell cycle. And during this phase, the cell will grow and increase in size. It will do the normal cell function. So if it's a liver cell, it will act like a liver cell. If it's a stomach lining cell, it will act like a stomach lining cell. So it does its usual function. At some point, it will get a message that it is time to begin the processes that will lead to cell reproduction. And so the cell goes through this G1 phase, followed by the S phase. S, you can think of it standing for synthesis. This is the time that the DNA is being replicated. And by the way, this whole process from here all the way around to here is referred to as interphase. It's the phase in between um, individual reproduction moments. So during the S phase, DNA replication occurs. And we see rather than having 23 pairs, well, we still have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but one of the chromosomes will reproduce, and it will have right next to it then a sister chromatid. It's a reproductive, it's just newly produced exact copy of itself. At the end of S phase, that's what we have. So at the beginning of S phase, it would have been a single chromatid making up the chromosome. At the end, we have two what are referred to as sister chromatids because they are twin copies of each other. And at this time also, the centrosome, remember it was those two barrel-shaped centrioles that were set at right angles to each other. The centrosome replicates. That also is about getting the cell prepared for being able to divide the cytoplasm. Then we go through an intense phase of protein productions because there's about to be the need for a lot of the microtubules, a lot of the proteins that are found in the cytoplasm. There's just going to be a lot of need for all those proteins. So intensive protein reproduction or production and um, it's all happening uh, here in G2. Oh shoot, I think I just said that the centrosome replicates in synthesis. It, so I apologize, that happens in G2. I was looking at my notes badly. Okay, so G1, cell growth, it does its normal function. S, it is reproducing the genetic material. And normal function is continuing as well during this time. And then G2, we produce a second centrosome and a lot of, we really go into, the cell really goes into overtime producing lots of proteins so that it can be ready for division to happen. Then the cell goes into a process called mitosis. Mitosis is the period of time when the nucleus will divide, producing two identical nuclei um, that will be the nuclei for the two daughter cells. And then finally, we wrap up with a process called cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is the division of all the cytoplasm. So mitosis is nuclear division. Cytokinesis is a cytoplasm division. Okay, so 
you've seen now interface with G1S uh, and G2. Now let's look more closely at mitosis, the division of nuclear material, and the four stages that we can divide it into. Now, the, of course, mitosis is a continuous process. It's not like it, uh, you know, it, it does prophase and then stops, takes a pause, and then does metaphase. So, you know, you, you, you've got to remember that this is a movie that is running. And we're going to, like, dip in at four different times in this movie and look and see what's happening in this movie that's running at those four different distinct times. So the four phases are called prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. To remember this, you can remember the mnemonic P mat. A T P. That's an M. No, it doesn't look like one there. Now it looks like one. P mat. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And we're going to look at each one of these phases uh, separately. So let's start with prophase. So here is, now they've, they're drawing the cell. And so here's a drawing of the cell. But notice the cell is almost all nucleus here. So you've got to remember that there's way more cytoplasm out there. But we're just really focused on what's happening with the nucleus. Because mitosis is all about nuclear division. So the first thing that has to happen is we've got to make space for all this to go down. And so the cell, the nuclear membrane, will begin to disintegrate it. It breaks apart into small shreds. Those shreds will then move off to the edges of the cell to get out of the way. And then we will later on reassemble the nuclear membrane back again. But they're small enough so that we don't really see any evidence of the nuclear membrane under a light microscope. The chromatin, remember that's the DNA, will coil, the coils will coil, the coiling will coiling, you know, so it's coiled coils of coils. That we get this super coiling that happens, and the chromatin then condenses, and it begins to form the chromosomes here during prophase. So we have, um, this is a photo of a light micrograph, uh, so light microscope of a whitefish uh, cell that is undergoing, uh, or that is it currently in prophase. So you can see that the nuclear envelope is getting a little raggedy. The chromosomes are beginning to appear. So before, we could not see the chromatin because it is, when it's all spooled out, it is not visible under a light microscope. But it's become beginning to condense and produce um, the chromosomes. The centrosomes migrate to opposite edges of the cell. So here is one centrosome, here's another. And you can see that there is like these tube kind of things that are kind of radiating away from the centrosome. Those are the microtubules that will begin to start developing. So we're growing microtubules by attaching tubulin protein to a tubulin protein parts until you get a long microtubule. And they will start to attach to the chromosomes themselves. So by the end of prophase, the I should be back here. By the end of prophase, the nuclear envelope is gone. It disintegrates. The chromosomes are all visible, and the spindle fibers have formed. So here we can see metaphase. Metaphase at metaphase, the spindle fibers have now all attached here to the lined-up chromosome. So if you were to rotate this image in your mind about 90 degrees, you would see the spindle fibers here. Oh, wait, what am I saying? You don't need to rotate anything. I rotated this image. That's what I was thinking about. Um, so I've rotated this image to be in the same orientation here. The spindle fibers are forming, and they will attach right here at a structure called the centromere. Centromere. It's all one word. So the centromere is the point of attachment for the spindle fibers. And the spindle, the, the chromosomes will motor along the spindle fibers until they get all lined up at the equator of the cell. So this, is, this would be the equator here of the cell. And you can see they're nicely lined up in our whitefish cell. So by the end of mitosis, Everything is all lined up neatly along the equator. And what this does is get everything organized 
all the chromosomes organized so that we can pull apart these sister chromatids here. Sister chromatids are right there. Here's one sister chromatid, here's the other. And the spindle fibers will be able to yank them apart. Okay, so the next stage is called anaphase. You can tell that anaphase is happening because the sister chromatids form these like arrows pointing away from each other. And it looks a little bit like geese flying. And they're flying, so half of them are flying to the North Pole, half are flying to the South Pole. What this does is drags apart the sister chromatids so that the resulting daughter cells are going to have a full complement of, pro of chromosomes in their nuclei when we do division. So by the end of anaphase, the, um, the, chrom the sister chromatids are fully separated and are clustered near the centrosomes that are found at the opposite poles of the cell. We're almost done. This is now telophase. Um, while it's not the right root word, I think of tele. Tele means difference, distance, like telephone is hearing over a distance. Telophase is where we have the chromosomes at opposite ends now of the cell. And at the, by the end of telophase, the nuclear envelope will have reformed around the chromosomes, and the chromosomes will uncoil and uncoil and uncoil until they return to their chromatin form. The nucleus will fully reform by the end of telophase, and the nucleoli, which also blasted apart into small bits during prophase, will reform again, and we'll be able to see them inside the nucleus. And the spindle fibers begin to dis disintegrate. And notice at, here at the end of telophase, we also see some narrowing of the space between the two cells. What's happening here is that spindle fi uh, microtubules are wrapping around and then being getting smaller and smaller and smaller and they're pulling a waste between the two cells and nuclear membrane is forming there at, the, at that waste. So that by the time we get to cytokinesis, the nucleus has mostly reformed the chromosomes have then decondensed into chromatin, and we have two genetically identical daughter cells. Now, in the human body, they usually remain attached to each other so that, you know, we can have continuous tissues. But if it's, say, blood cells that are doing this, then uh, they may become disattached from each other. And now the two new daughter cells have, are entering interphase. They're beginning the next stage of the cell cycle. So there you have it. Prophase, where the um, nucleus is disintegrating, the chromosomes are condensing, and uh, the spindle fibers are forming. Anaphase, where, I'm uh, sorry, metaphase, P, mat, metaphase where the chromosomes are lined up along the equator and the spindle fibers are firmly attached. Anaphase where the, the chromosomes begin to motor along the spindle fibers, dragging themselves toward the centrosomes. And then telophase and cytokinesis where the nucleus reforms, the nucleoli also reform, the, the chromosome decondenses and the cell cytoplasm will then um, divide, forming two new identical daughter cells and restarting interphase again. So how does a cell know when it's time to divide? Well, the, and, and, and what is it that controls that? Well, how frequently and how many times a cell can divide is really dependent on the cell type. The skin, the cells of the skin, the blood and the intestinal lining, those stem cells that replace any of the damaged cells are dividing almost continuously. They end their um, telophase and cytokinesis and they almost immediately turn around and begin mitosis once more. 
bones like the, or I'm sorry, cells like the liver and the bone cells do divide. They will continue to grow, but they do it at a much slower pace, and they so they divide much less often. And then there are some cells in the body that once they are fully mature, they will no longer be able to divide. And so nerve cells, skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, they all divide, can divide and divide until they reach maturity. And then at that point, what you got is what you got. And all you can do is lose neurons after that point. Um, and there's a lot of different um, signals that tell a cell when it's time to divide. We don't fully understand all this yet. That's a big area of cancer research. But there are some internal factors that can control this. Cells will divide until um, when the cell gets so large that it becomes difficult to get oxygen and food materials toward the center of the cell because diffusion can be a pretty slow process if you have long distances to go. And there are little tips at the end of the DNA called telomeres, and every time that a cell divides, the telomeres on the DNA get a little bit shorter. And that can also be a signal saying, okay, we've reached a point where we've divided so many times, our dividing time is, you know, that cell's dividing days are all done. And then the hormones, and growth factors can send out signals that, hey, it's time for the cells to divide a lot. There's a hormone called growth hormone that can really stimulate the growth and reproduction of cells. And sometimes when um, cells fill up a space, something called contact inhibition, the fact that the cells are crammed really hard against each other, will slow down the rate of the cell division. But if we lose control over the division of a cell and the cell begins to divide uncontrolled, then that's what's thought of as a tumor. A tumor is a mass of cells that forget that they are supposed to stop dividing. And they will, even if they run out of space, they will continue to divide, making a larger and larger clump of tissue. If that tissue is benign, that means it's a tumor that doesn't invade other tissues um, and isn't going to spread throughout the body. But as it gets larger, it could cause issues. Say if this was a benign tumor in the brain, then it could press on nervous tissue of the brain and cause some weird effects, some inappropriate signaling to occur in the brain. But the tumors that are very worrisome to uh, medical professionals and to the people who have them are what are called malignant tumors. These are cancers. Tumors that, as they grow, they invade other tissues and interfere with the activity of other, other body cells, uh, stealing resources and eventually killing the body if it's a, if it's a very da you know, a dangerous malignant tumor. So, <clears throat> I've got two pictures of some malignant tumors. Here's a malignant melanoma, by the, one of the scariest of the skin cancers. And here we can see some cancerous growth um, on the interior of, of a colon. And, um, and this is one that was, you know, a colon that was removed in a process called a col colectomy. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I went out of order with my notes and my slides, and I forgot about that. So here's that information that I was giving you about the telomeres and about contact inhibition, growth factors, and how as cells get too large, they might be encouraged to divide. And here's a great, oh, I love this photo. It's been color enhanced because electron micrographs are always in black and white, but it shows two cells caught in the act of dividing. I think that's awesome. So you've probably heard of stem cells. They have been all the rage in the news lately. Stem cells are cells that can reproduce extensively, and they produce daughter and, and they are, are, are cells that we think of as being undifferentiated. They still have access to a large amount of the DNA and can produce cells that will um, differentiate into different kinds of cells in the body. Um, so stem cells are thought of it's unspecialized cells because they are um, cells that that 
haven't been fully differentiated. Usually when a cell becomes fully differentiated, it will lose the ability to divide. So it's the stem cells that can, through the life of the body, continue to divide to replace cells that have been damaged or lost. When we think about embryonic stem cells, so the earliest of the cells that are associated with a developing embryo, the first several divisions, we talk about them as being totipotent or totipotent, although totipotent I think is the more appropriate um, pronunciation of these stem cells. If, if a cell is totipotent, it has the potential to become any cell in the body. We just have to give it the right signals. Progenitor cells are cells that are partially totipotent. So they have partially differentiated, and when they divide, they can only produce a smaller subset of specialized cells. So we might think about the stem cells that lead to, um, or, or, the, or that, are, that divide and produce daughter cells so that will then develop into either red blood cells or one of the several types of white blood cells or it could be, um, it could grow and develop into a um, cell that's going to produce platelets. So these stem cells that are there in the bone marrow that are going to produce these blood cells, their daughter cells could develop into one of, of 12 different or so different kinds of cells. So we talk about progenitor cells as being pluripotent. And we don't say pluripotent for some reason, but pluripotent rather than totipotent. Pluripotent cells have the ability to become a very specific subset of multiple cell types. So progenitor cells can become one of a few cells as, they, as their offspring grow and divide, while um, stem cells have a much greater variability in them. So to wrap up this chapter then, we just need to talk about the idea of cell death and what happens during cell death. There are two ways that a cell can die. A cell can die because it's important in time for it to die. I think I've already given you the example of the human hand that develops first from a paddle, but we see the death of cells that separate the fingers from each other and from the thumb. One, two, three. Hey, I did better that time. It kind of looks like a hand. Um, so that process of orderly cell death under, the, under genetic guidance, where the packets of lysosomes in the cell um, are used to kill the cell, is referred to as apoptosis. So you say apo, and then this P is silent, and then tosis, apoptosis. So it's not apop apoptosis, but apoptosis. Apoptosis is an orderly process of a cell dying because it's been told to die, it's time for it to die, so that um, the body can do what it needs to do with that space. Necrosis, on the other hand, is cell death as a result of disease or of cellular dysfunction. So if you get a, a disease and it kills your cells, then that killing is called necrosis. And in the process of De dying, the cell will release a lot of chemical factors that result in inflammation. So apoptosis does not cause inflammation, necrosis will. Two very different processes of cell death. All right, so you're done now with chapter three. So let's just review some of the important points. We looked at how cells differ from one another. What are some characteristics that, um, in that cause differentiate, you know, differences in cells. We looked at a composite cell and its general characteristics, including the cell membrane, all the organelles that we find in it, and the nucleus. Then we looked at how materials are moved into and out of the cells, either through active processes or passive processes. And some of the active processes were active transport, endo and exocytosis, uh, cell-mediated endocytosis, or receptor-mediated endocytosis transcytosis. The passive processes included diffusion, facilitated diffusion, filtration, and osmosis, the diffusion of water. Then we looked at the cell cycle and the activities that are involved when the cell divides, and then some of the control of cell division. And then we talked about stem cells, progenitor cells, 
and the organized cell death versus disorganized cell death. Apoptosis versus necrosis. So there you have it. Chapter 3, all done. Hope you're ready. Give me a call. Send me an email. Come to office hours if you have any questions. The exam will be on Wednesday. Good luck studying. Thank you.